Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Caution. The last story in this podcast is extremely graphic and may not be suitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. We've all heard of or seen the Boogeyman. He's the monster who hid under your bed and in your closet when you were a kid. He gave you nightmares and made you afraid of the dark. But what happens when a real-life Boogeyman exists? In the early 1900s, too large a number of unfortunate children found out. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, uh, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, so still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then where that is and this mystery explore. 
Let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above the chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. But this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, though my crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he muttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness, broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of a bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent me, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird of devil, whether temper sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting. Bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. 
quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul, from out that shadow that lies floating, on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. On a hot, sunny summer morning, halfway up the mountainside, opposite the Macbeth Arms near Alford in Aberdeenshire, a small boy dressed in Victorian sailor suit came skipping along past me. He looked real, except that he was sort of lit up, kind of glowing and so clean. He passed between a co-worker and myself. I couldn't break my gaze and just stood there, gobstruck. The lad wasn't touching the ground and effortlessly swept past. Where had he come from? There's nothing but empty mountain for miles above us. Where was he going? It's a long way to the road. He was way too young to be out here on his own. You see that? Charlie? The lad had passed between us, I asked my co-worker. See what? He grunted and continued knocking in a fence post. I knew before I'd asked he hadn't. What happened that sunny morning 25 years ago will never leave me. One of my favorite parts of the country is the area just south of Pittsburgh in the southwestern part of Pennsylvania. With family and close friends in the area, I have spent an inordinate amount of time in California, in Brownsville, home of haunted Nemecolin Castle, getting tattooed at Second Skin in Charleroi, and eating way too much Promontis Brothers sandwiches, Armando's Pizza, and open-faced sandwiches at Rise. I love the area, and it's a place of many mysteries and legends, from mine disasters to haunted houses. But one of the great mysteries is that of the ghost bomber that vanished over the region 60 years ago and has never been found. On January 31, 1956, Major William Dotson and five crew members and passengers were flying a B-25 bomber over the Pittsburgh area on a routine training flight from Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada to pick up a cargo of airplane parts at Olmsted Air Force Base in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. During the cross-country flight, the plane refueled at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma and Selfridge Air Force Base in Michigan. The mission was going smoothly until around 4 p.m. when the crew reported a loss of fuel and asked for permission to land at the Greater Pittsburgh Airport. But when Major Dotson realized that their remaining fuel wouldn't last, he asked to land at the Allegheny County Airport instead. At 4.11, with his fuel supply almost depleted, his engine malfunctioning, and with no available airstrips in range, Dotson was forced to make a quick decision. 
as the B-25 bomber glided silently over the Homestead High-Level Bridge, now Homestead Grays Bridge, Dotson made a wheels-up splash landing into the Monongahela River. All of the crew members survived the crash, although only four of them were rescued from the icy water. After floating with the plane for 11 minutes, it sank beneath the water. Two men, Captain Gene Ingraham and Staff Sergeant Walter Sosi, drowned while trying to swim to shore. Their bodies were not found until months later. As the Coast Guard arrived on the scene, a cutter, Forsythia, managed to snag the wing of the submerged plane while dragging its anchor, but the line slipped off and the B-25 sank deeper into the river. The U.S. Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers searched the river for 14 days, but the B-25 bomber was never seen again. No one could explain how a 15-foot-high B-25 bomber could go missing in just 20 feet of water, but the fact remains that it has never been found after all these years. It remains a mystery that plagues researchers and military buffs to this day. Conspiracy theories abound. Some believe that the bomber carried dangerous cargo and that the military secretly recovered the plane's wreckage immediately after the landing to hide its true contents. And the contents? A nuclear bomb, some say, or even a UFO from Nellis Air Base, home of the mysterious Area 51. Others say that the plane carried Soviet agents at the height of the Cold War, or Las Vegas showgirls who were on their way to entertain senators in Washington, D.C. Others offer a more mundane solution to the mystery of the vanished plane. The river, polluted by decades of industrial mills, ate away the aluminum exterior of the craft long ago, leaving only the engines and landing gear behind making it too difficult to find. In recent years, a team of volunteers worked with the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh to find the elusive plane. But despite an extensive search, sonar scanners, and remote-controlled underwater cameras, no trace of the plane was found. The Ghost Bomber remains one of Southwest Pennsylvania's most enduring unsolved mysteries. I've had my fair share of surgeries, 13 to be exact, due to my cancer. Surgery for me is usually an easy thing with little to no complications. I never had a problem, though there is one horrific scene I wish I could forget. Back in the days when my lifespan was questionable, surprise operations were not uncommon. One dreadful day, they were operating on a port malfunction that occurred unexpectedly late one October night. Surgery at 3 a.m. is not ideal, but on the rare occasion, it must be performed by dutiful surgeons. Before inhaling the anesthesia that would leave me unconscious, a black mass started to fill the room. Once the oxygen mask was on, I tried to focus on my parents' faces as they slowly morphed into blankness, all the while praying that everything would go well, secretly trying not to freak out. I woke up before I was supposed to and was told later that they were stitching me up when I woke up for a short while. I became agitated and was screaming my head off and cussing out my beloved doctors while thrashing around violently, not normal behavior for me. They could not explain how I woke up, just that I did, twice, and I could see they were reluctant to tell my parents about this. The second time I woke up, I was all alone in a dark room unusual because my parents would stay with me constantly. A dark figure hovered over me and began to laugh manically. The creepy part was that he was in a bloody mask and was hairy all over his body and had two small horns poke out of his head. Panicked, I tried to move or scream, but was unable to. He just stared at me with his red, evil eyes, and I eventually passed out again. I do not believe this was a dream because I've never remembered a dream during surgery, nor have I ever hallucinated before. 
I've never had a problem during surgery before or since, though I have had other paranormal experiences and I've always wondered if it could be the same demonic entity. This all took place in Colorado at a hospital in downtown Denver. Though I am quite a bit older now, this memory has always spooked me. So this isn't very long, but I was at my mom's friend's house, and I was staying the night, and before I went to bed, I was sitting on this big, super heavy rocking chair. At about 3.30 a.m., I woke up to a huge thump and went to investigate, and the rocking chair that was in the living room the night before was in the second spare bedroom, and then I felt something brush past me, so I turned around and standing there was a young boy. He waved at me and then vanished. Buzau Mountains in Romania are beautiful, and many strange things seem to take place there. This magnificent landscape is still greatly unexplored and shrouded in a veil of mystery. Mysterious ruins, stories of unknown ancient races, and the presence of supernatural forces in the area are all aspects that, woven together, constitute an ancient mystery story few people can resist. One curious event took place in 1981 when two brothers went to the mountains for training. Both of them were skilled climbers. After climbing circa three-quarters of an abrupt high rock, one of the brothers noticed some strange signs carved onto the rock, but they were very eroded. When reaching the top of the rock that was a narrow place, one of the brothers observed a strange yellowish object that looked like a chain he decided to take a closer look at the puzzling object, but as soon as he touched it, something unexplained happened. The man was stunned by some unknown force and vanished into thin air right in front of his brother. His brother alerted the police immediately and they came to investigate, but soon the officers accused the remaining brother of hiding evidence and they even threatened him. Angry and worried, the father of the two men decided to search for his missing son on his own. He was also an experienced climber, and he did not fear mountains. Perhaps if he followed the way up to the top, he could find some traces that could shed more light on the mysterious disappearance of his son. When he reached the top, he saw the strange object, and he vanished into thin air in front of ten people who observed the event from the ground. In the next few days, some experts came to research the surroundings. The area was thoroughly examined. A helicopter also checked the region, but nothing abnormal was found. Since there were no traces of the missing people and nothing unusual had been found, a decision was taken to demolish the entire rock with dynamite. Many strange and unexplained events take place all over the world, and this mysterious incident was one of them but elder local people have heard of and even witnessed other strange events, like unusual color of the sky for a certain amount of time, occasionally blue fog responsible for other vanishings, or even short-distance teleportation. It should be mentioned that this area is part of a seismic zone. Nature is often unpredictable. Or is there something else going on here? Currently, human teleportation remains in the realm of science fiction, but some scientists think it may actually be possible to instantly move from one place to another in the near future. Many decades ago, Charles Fort, the scientist who coined the word himself, displayed some of his outstanding collection of recorded phenomena, which he indicated might have something to do with teleportation. There are many stories of people who have experienced teleportation, 
How is it possible if we lack proper technology? One of the strangest teleportation stories deals with Gil Perez, a 16th century soldier and guard who spontaneously teleported from Manila to Mexico, and the case remains unexplained. Another intriguing teleportation account is described in the book The Silent Road, written by Tudor Pohl, who claims that he was teleported several miles from his home during a rainy December evening. Major Tudor Wellesley Pohl, 1884-1968, was a celebrated mystic and author of many books. He was deeply interested in spiritualism, the Arthurian legend, the Holy Grail, and the Baha'i Faith, a religion teaching the essential worth of all religions and the unity and equality of all people. According to Pohl, this strange event took place when he was sitting at a country station a few miles away from his Sussex home. Pohl was waiting for the London train that was delayed due to bad weather, and the last bus had left. There were also no taxis available so he could get home. It was five minutes to six, and he was eager to get home because he was expecting a very important call at 6 p.m. He had no chance to make the call from the station because the lines were down. Three minutes to six, something very odd happened. He had no idea how or what had really taken place, but Paul was suddenly standing in the hall of his home, a good one and a half miles away, and the clock was striking six. Some unknown and unexplained force had moved him from the train station straight to his home, just in time for the phone call he had expected. After he finished talking on the phone, Paul looked at his shoes and noticed they were very dry and free from mud, and his clothes showed no sign of damage or dampness. The question remains, how did Paul return back to his home one and a half miles away in just two minutes? Was he teleported? If so, how and by whom? We cannot answer these questions. Scientists have demonstrated it's possible to teleport all the information contained within a particle. Since then, physicists have been able to teleport such objects as light or single atoms over short distances from one spot to another in a split second. In the coming years, researchers may be able to teleport water molecules, carbon dioxide, and finally DNA or organic molecules. The next great scientific breakthrough will probably be to successfully teleport solid objects. Eventually, if all goes well, these successful experiments will open up many possibilities for future teleportation of humans. However, teleportation raises baffling questions about a person's existence. One thing science cannot answer is what happens to the soul if someone is teleported. part of a group that meets at a New Age-style business. And recently, another woman had joined the group from the beginning. I, I could not warm to her. She seriously creeped me out, but I kept my feelings to myself. Before too long, others started voicing the same opinions. Couldn't put my finger on it. It was the creepy grin she often had, the way she tried elevating herself above the group or what. One night, after our meeting, we were chatting in the gift shop area of the business when she walked through. I glanced up in time to catch a sight of a crouched figure in one of the aisles. It was bald, with long limbs. It reminded me of Gollum. Its skin was gray, blotchy, and looked like it was naked. I only saw it for a moment as it moved and disappeared. I turned to my friend, who was a medium. You saw it too, didn't you? She asked me, yes, what was that? What did you see? I told my friend, bald, naked, gray thing. I don't know what it is, but it always follows her around. Thankfully, it was the only time I saw it. And thankfully, she has since moved on from our group.
I still have much more weird darkness on the way, including a bizarre creature in West Virginia known as the Flatwood Monster, plus the real-life boogeyman Albert Fish, a man so creepy you might want to send children out of the room before listening to his story. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. If you're planning a picnic, most everybody knows your biggest enemy is going to be ants. Those dreaded, six-legged, creepy crawlers that seem capable of lifting an entire pickup truck over their heads and walking away with it. If the pickup truck was edible, that is. I don't think they have much need for a four-wheel drive vehicle. Now, replace your picnic pest with, instead of an insect, a Sasquatch. That is apparently what happened to one family, for realsies. You can hear the entire story in this week's Mind of Marlar at mindofmarlar.com. The Flatwood Monster, also known as the Braxton County Monster or the Flatwood Ghost, is an unknown creature, perhaps a cryptid or an alien who allegedly was seen in Flatwoods, Braxton County, West Virginia on September 12, 1952. It all began on the afternoon of September 12 when the office of Sheriff Robert Carr and his deputy Barnell Long received a call from witnesses of a strange phenomenon. Eyewitnesses claimed that they saw a fiery object flying in the sky, which then fell to the ground in the area of the Elk River. Having received the message, the sheriff concluded that a plane had fallen. It was later found out no aircraft in the place had fallen, though. However, late in the evening, he received another strange message, this time from a group of children who played football in the schoolyard. The children saw a falling object, which disappeared behind the hill on the lands belonging to the farmer Bailey Fisher. They decided to go in search of the object. On the way, they went into the house of Kathleen May, and she joined the group along with her two sons. When they reached the hill, Kathleen May noted that in the evening mist there was a strong smell of metal, which irritated their eyes and noses. Ahead of a group of people, a dog ran, but suddenly it returned with a frightened look and a tail between its legs. At the top of the hill, people saw less than a hundred meters ahead a glowing and hissing object about three meters in diameter. Then the people came closer. It was night, and the group saw two small lights next to each other. One of the boys had a flashlight, and when he turned it toward the lights to get a better look at them, the light was snatched away by a very large creature three meters high with a bright red face, bright green clothes, and a head that looked like the playing card symbol of the Ace of Spades. His clothes hung to the bottom and was in large folds. Suddenly the creature swam through the air straight in the direction of a group of people, forcing them to flee in a panic from the hill down. They ran to the house, and that's when they called the sheriff's office. By the time the sheriff and his people arrived at the place of the call, there were already a lot of local residents who were called by the children. Along with the sheriff also came the reporter A. Lee Stewart from the newspaper Braxton Democrat, who began interviewing witnesses about the incident. Later, he noted that everyone who saw the creature was very frightened. Stewart also visited the hill, accompanied by one of the sons of Catherine May, and himself noted a strange, unpleasant smell but he did not notice anything unusual there. However, when Stewart returned to the hill the next morning, he did see mysterious tracks. According to Sheriff Carr, eyewitnesses watched the meteorite fall 
and on the hill everyone saw just some animal whose eyes shone in the dark and could scare everybody. This seemingly plausible explanation does not explain many details in the testimony of eyewitnesses, though. And the next night brought even more mysteriousness. A local resident, whose house is near the Birch River, said that he saw a bright orange object that circled in the sky above the town of Flatfoot, and another local resident and her mother claimed to have seen a huge creature about 11 miles from the hill where the first eyewitnesses saw him. Later, the researcher John Keel found another pair that saw the monster. The well-known researcher of anomalous phenomenon Ivan Sanderson also visited the place, who carefully examined the scene, took soil samples, and also interviewed the eyewitnesses. After meeting with the creature on September 12th, several members of the group reported that they had symptoms similar to those that had existed for some time during their time in the fog emitted by the creature, symptoms including nasal irritation and throat edema. 17-year-old Eugene Lemon suffered from vomiting and seizures throughout the night, and he had trouble with his throat for several weeks after that. A doctor who treated several witnesses reportedly described their symptoms as similar to those of mustard gas, although such symptoms are also common in those suffering from hysteria that may be caused by the impact of a traumatic or shocking event. After reviewing the case 48 years after the events of Joe Nickel, a member of the CSI investigative team, then known as CSICOP, skeptical about paranormal phenomena, concluded in the year 2000 that the bright light in the sky reported by witnesses on September 12th was likely to have been a meteorite. A pulsating red light most likely came from an airplane or a lighthouse, and the creature described by the witnesses reminded him of an owl. Nickel argues that the last two circumstances were distorted due to the state of heightened anxiety felt by the witnesses after they noticed the first. Nickel's conclusions are shared by a number of other researchers, including the Air Force. On the night of September 12th, a meteorite was observed in three states, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, and there was an erroneous report that a flaming plane crashed into a hillside in Elk River, about 11 miles or 18 kilometers to the southwest from the alleged place of observation of the being. From the field of observation, three flashing red lights of the aircraft were also seen. Perhaps their pulsating red light was seen by witnesses and mistaken for the red color on the face of the creature. Nickel came to the conclusion that the shape, movements, and sounds of the creature reported by the witnesses also correspond to the silhouette, the flight pattern, and the sounds of the barn owl sitting on the tree branch which led the researchers to conclude that the foliage under the owl may have created the illusion of the lower part of a creature, described as a pleated green skirt. The researchers also concluded that the lack of agreement among the witnesses on whether the creature had a weapon, combined with Kathleen May's story about having small, tenacious hands that were stretched out in front of him, also corresponds to the description barn owls with claws clutching the branch of the tree. Alternative explanations put forward by local media include the version that on September 12th, the group witnessed the fall of the meteorite, which resulted in a cloud of steam in the form of a man, and also that they allegedly saw some kind of secret government aircraft. But even after decades, the mystery remains. Nowadays, every year in Flatwoods in West Virginia, a festival is held in honor of the Green Monster, lasting from Friday to mid-Sunday where live music is played, a monster museum is opened, and excursions are conducted to the place of its alleged observation. I grew up in York County, Virginia, less than a mile from where part of the Revolutionary War was fought. The whole area has different stories about them. The elder generation in my family is not religious but very superstitious, so they told us stories about people seeing things at different times of day and night, and how some people have vanished without a trace, or something made them resort to drug and alcohol abuse. I love a good story, so I always paid attention. 
I was 19, I think, and some of my college classmates had heard different stories from the area and joked about them. So I told them I could prove it, just didn't know how right then. My grandma, then my mom, aunts, uncles, and older cousin used to tell us exactly how they worded it, you don't F with the dead at all. One fall night, I was bored and the cool air made me want to do something outside, so I got my classmates together and decided to give them a ghost tour. At the time, I lived with my uncle, my mom's youngest brother. He was very protective of me. He asked me where I was going, being it already dark, late, and cold. I told him I was going to scare the crap out of my classmates. He reminded me of the warnings beat into my head by the elders of the family. I didn't listen of course. We all met up and got into my jeep. The first stop was my other uncle's grave. I was named after him, except for the middle initial. They didn't know that, and his middle initial was not on his gravestone. As I walked them back to it, there were no street lights at all. I told them some story about how some people don't know they're dead. The only light was my huge flashlight gun-looking thing, when we got to it, I show them the grave. I shine the light on it, and there it was. My name. Well, my uncle's and my name. And one of my friends freaks out and runs off into the darkness. Well, we retrieved him, of course. I had a good laugh, but I had one more place to show them. These were the actual trenches the colonists fought in during the Battle of Yorktown. The older people told us never to go there, day or night. I never went there because my mom would kick my butt if she ever found out, well, no matter how old I was. We're walking out there, like I said, no street lights at all whatsoever, not even moonlight. But I had my handy flashlight gun, but then we noticed two large black silhouettes. I assumed they were deer, so I pointed the light at them. The light beam, I know, sounds like DBZ, went right through. So one of the guys in our group was about to walk over and try to scare them off. It was then I noticed they were on two legs and were charging straight at us. I was like, forget this, and started booking back to the car. My classmates followed me and the shadows were picking up speed. Even though they were running, I, I guess their movement made no sound at all. So the Jeep, it's like another few feet away. So I yelled, if you trip, you're screwed. I'm not coming back for you. I'm a coward, I know. The brave usually get killed in the movies. The shadows were still advancing, but thank God we all got in the car together. I was screaming, they were screaming, and couldn't hear the beeps that would allow me to start the engine. Finally, somehow, I got it going and I peeled off. The crazy part was the shadows stopped right there at the road, and I'd parked on the other side of the road. It was like they were telling us what we were doing was disturbing and disrespectful to them. I know now why the elders tell us these stories. I thought of telling our kids those stories, but we live far away from there. I may save them for a dark and stormy night. Word of advice, don't take history sites as a joke. Caution. The following story is graphic and may not be suitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. We've all heard of, or seen, the Boogeyman. He's the monster who hid under your bed and in your closet when you were a kid. He gave you nightmares and made you afraid of the dark. But what happens when a real-life boogeyman exists? In the early 1900s, too large a number of unfortunate children found out. He's been known by a few different names – the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Grey Man, even the Brooklyn Vampire. No matter the alias, Albert Fish is the notorious boogeyman killer whose attacks took place over the span of 10 years causing terror in New York and throughout the United States. Born Hamilton Fish, he changed his name to Albert to commemorate a dead sibling. Fish's father was 43 years older than his mother 
and died by the time Fish was five. Many of the facts regarding his early years are largely unknown. However, what little details we do have point toward a deeply troubling childhood. Mental illness and religious mania ran in his family. After his father died from a heart attack, Fish's mother placed him in an orphanage. The reasons behind this are unknown, but we can safely assume they are linked to his mother's wavering income and her inability to care for all four children she had. The orphanage is where Fish had his first exposure to violence. He was repeatedly whipped and beaten. After these beatings had gone on for a time, Fish began finding sexual pleasure in the beatings, which brought on vicious teasing from the other children in the orphanage. In 1882, his mother landed a government job and was able to bring Fish back under her roof. But by then, the damage had already been done. Fish began a consensual relationship with a telegraph boy at 12. This boy introduced him to less accepted sexual practices, including drinking urine and feces. Fish began spending his weekends in public baths, watching the young boys undress. He was still just in his early teens. Upon arriving in New York City in 1890, Fish claimed that he became a prostitute. When this was no longer enough to satisfy his urge, he began raping young boys. This practice continued even after he agreed to a marriage arranged by his mother to a woman six years his junior. The couple had six children. He was arrested for embezzlement and spent a handful of years in prison. During that time, he carried out sexual relations with countless men. When he was released, he began an affair with a lover despite his marriage. One afternoon, Fish and the man visited a waxworks museum where the pair witnessed the bisection of a penis. From that moment, Fish developed a fascination with castration. Later, Fish managed to tie up his male partner who thought it was part of a game. But when Fish attempted to castrate him, the man panicked, managed to escape, and ran away. No one knows what became of him. After this, Fish increased the number of times he visited brothels, where he asked to be beaten and whipped. In January of 1917, Fish's wife left him for the handyman who'd been staying with them. She took their six children with her. Shortly after their departure, Fish began hearing voices. He once rolled himself up in a carpet saying that he was following the orders of John the Apostle. What may have been Fish's first attack was recorded in 1910, a stabbing which killed a child named Thomas Bedden. A few years later, in 1919, Fish stabbed a mentally handicapped boy. From this time on, Fish's victims were nearly always either mentally disabled or African American. Fish believed no one would notice when these children went missing. Over the next decade, Fish's crimes became increasingly violent and frequent. Although it's unknown just how many children he killed, thanks in part to his tendency to choose victims that would go unnoticed, the murder of three children by Fish can be confirmed. Young Francis McDonald was discovered missing by his parents in 1924. Out for the day playing catch with friends, McDonald never returned home. McDonald's friends and mother both reported seeing a gray man watching the boys play. After a search, McDonald's body was discovered with extensive signs of torture and sexual assault. One other exception to Fish's rule of choosing victims at the edge of society was Billy Gaffney. Fish attacked Gaffney, who was playing in the hallway outside his family's apartment in Brooklyn with his friend Billy Beaton in 1927. Both boys mysteriously disappeared. The neighbors immediately started looking for them. Hours later, Beaton was found on the roof. When he was asked what happened to Gaffney, the child famously said, the boogeyman took him. Beaton was reported missing and sightings began flooding in, including one claiming to have seen an older man with the boy on a trolley. The boy was crying for his mother while the man was trying to quiet him. Eventually, the man dragged the boy off the trolley. The police matched the description to Gaffney's. 
Gaffney's body was never found. Fish later confessed to murdering him, dismembering the body, cooking and eating it. Just over a year after this crime, Fish committed perhaps his most infamous murder. He came across a classified ad in the Sunday paper by a young immigrant boy, Edward Budd, seeking employment. Fish responded, posing as a farmer wanting to hire a farmhand. When discussing this crime with authorities after his arrest, he noted his intention had been to kidnap and murder Bud. But then he saw Bud's younger sister Grace, and his plans changed. He returned for a second meeting, offered Bud the job, and asked if the parents would allow Grace to accompany Fish to his niece's birthday party that evening at his sister's home. He said the girls were about the same age and would likely make great friends. The parents granted permission and Grace left with Fish that day, but never returned. What's creepiest about all of this? After her disappearance, not only was the wrong man tried for the crime, serving nearly a year in jail before the actual culprit was caught, but the family also received a letter from Fish. Riddled with misspellings, the note relayed what exactly had happened to the girl and how Fish came to his lust for human meat. Although in the letter Fish claimed the girl died a virgin, he confessed during an interrogation with police that he did rape her. However, Fish was known to compulsively lie, so it's impossible to know the facts of the case. The trial for the murders of the three children lasted 10 days. Fish pleaded insanity, claiming to have heard the voice of God telling him to kill the children. The jury heard evidence from his children, doctors, and his victims' relatives. The most famous and disturbing evidence from the trial was an X-ray of Fish's genitals. Over 20 needles had been embedded there by Fish himself. There was much debate on whether his sexual fetishes meant he was insane, but ultimately the jury found him sane and guilty, and the judge ordered the death sentence. Upon his initial arrest, Fish boasted that he had had a child in every state. This would skyrocket the number of his victims, exceeding 50. However, it remains undetermined if this meant molestation, cannibalization, or both. As Fish was also known to lie and exaggerate, it is unclear if we should believe his boast. As it is, the deaths of the three children, Bud, Gaffney, and McDonnell, were enough to send him to the electric chair at Sing Sing. Thanks to his hunger for human flesh and horrifying fetishes, this boogeyman will live in infamy. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>